Okay, I make these uh, slip leads to donate to shelters, and uh, they cost about $2.05 to make. I've had people ask how I do that. So I'm going to make some more videos that show more about this. This video will be about this part, which I call the stopper. And the video is going to be a little bit long, and it's going to have quite a few topics. So if you look at the description below the video, uh, you can jump directly to a topic uh, without having to watch the whole video. You can get there pretty quickly if you just look at that description below the video. Um, the job of the stopper, all it does is it prevents this loop from expanding when the rope is slack. So the dog's head comes up through here. You slide the stopper on the rope until it's snug around the dog's neck. And then at that point, the stopper just has two characteristics. It, it has to be large enough that it won't pass th through the ring too easily. And it has to grip the rope tight enough that it won't move with the ring too easily either. However, it shouldn't grip the rope so tight that you can't adjust it easily. Um, I consider this part to be sacrificial or disposable. And that's because in a shelter environment, dogs tend to be frustrated. They bite the leash. Um, so this part tends to fail while the rope still has a lot of life left in it. So if, if volunteers know how to replace this part, they can get a lot more use out of a slip lead. And that's really just the point of this video. Um, I've made a few different designs, and here's three of them that I think are the most useful, the ones I like the most. Um, my goals have been, I've had two goals. The, the goals are to keep it inexpensive since it's disposable. You know, there's no reason to try and make it nice or stronger. It's still going to fail. So just I just try to keep it cheap. Uh, this costs about eight cents to make. Um, the other goal is that the parts should be easily obtainable at a local store. You know, if you have to go online and buy parts and stuff like that, specialized things, you know, that's that's not good. If you can just go down to Home Depot and buy this stuff, that's good. Uh, so next I'm going to give you an overview of each one of these. Uh, they each have their positives and negatives. I'll start with my first design and then I'll work my way through and that'll help explain how they differ if you understand like why I switched from this to this and then from that to that. Um, it's not that there's like a right one or a wrong one. It's They all have their positives and negatives and I'll just explain that. Um, I may sound obsessive about these stoppers and that's because uh, I've really been frustrated trying to find one that I really like, and uh, this was the first one I made. It's just a, a rigid knot. Um, the positives are that it withstands teeth strikes better than the cord lock, uh, so this is a good one for the shelter in that regard. Um, another positive is it's just made from paracord. Anybody can go to uh, the local hardware store and buy ordinary paracord and make this. So that's another positive. You don't have to like order strange stuff online. Um, the downside though is that it's not adjustable. It doesn't have any give built into it. When once it's tied, it, it, that's it. You know, it's just that's how big it's going to be. And so if the conditions of the rope change, uh, this won't adjust to it. And the reason that was a problem for me is, you know, I make these new. So when the rope is new, it's slippery. It's got a slick surface. And then after it's used for a while, it will develop kind of a fuzzy cloth-like surface. It'll feel kind of plumper and fatter, um, and that's because of the fibers on the outside fray. And I think that adds friction to this. So the problem I was having is that initially it might have felt too loose, and then after some use it might be too tight. And so it just really, I didn't like it. I didn't think it worked well for me, but it does look nice. It's easy to make. Um, you know, if somebody had to replace a stopper, you know, you, they might want to use this one. And, and if it becomes too tight over time, although by the time they have to replace one, hopefully the rope is more settled in and stable, uh, you know, with its surface. Um, you know, but if it becomes too tight, you just cut it off and throw it away. That's not bad. You know, it's not an expensive thing. So, so I'm including it here for that reason. Well, one thing I wanted to say about this. Uh, all of these stoppers, it's important to pre-shrink the paracord, and I'm going to show that uh, later in the video. And there's 
links to get to the topics in the description below the video so you can get there quickly if you need to. Um, but it's important to pre-shrink the paracord for any of these stoppers, but for this one especially because it has no give, you know, it has no adjustment. So you'd, you'd really want to pre-shrink this one and maybe even use hot water and hot drying heat to uh, really get all the shrink out of it. Um, because this one, once it's tied, you know, that's it, you're stuck. This is the uh, second stopper that I've made. It uses a uh, cord lock. And so what I like about this one, the positive, is that it's infinitely adjustable. Um, if it's too loose on the rope, just depress the cord lock and then pinch, twist, wiggle uh, this part of the cord, paracord here, and create more grip on the rope. Um, if it were too tight, then you just pull the cord lock away and flex this around to pull some of the slack into it and then pull it back. So I like this. It's, it's functional. It, it gets the job done. It looks nice. But in a shelter environment where the dogs bite the leash out of frustration, uh, this plastic I don't think holds up as long as, as you'd like it to. Um, it's, it's vulnerable to... Uh, the teeth hitting it and it'll break pretty easily. So I don't like it for the shelter environment. Um, another, another downside is that you can't find this part locally. So if you wanted to replace, replace these, um, you're gonna have to buy these cord locks online and that's kind of a hassle. Um, however, I will say anybody local to me, uh, I have found these at Tempe Sales on Broadway Road west of Mill Avenue. Uh, but for most people, you know, you're not going to find this locally. And I, I put in the description of this video, below the video, I put, I show where I buy these, where I buy them, where I found the lowest price. And, but I buy in bulk, so that may not be suitable for most people who just want to make this for home use. Um, I do like it, though. It looks nice, and that's why I'm inclu including it in the video. You know, it's, it's nice for well-behaved dogs for home use. I still use it at home. And so some people might want to use it. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's handy. This is the uh, third stopper I've made, and it uses ordinary vinyl tube from the hardware store. And uh, I only started using this recently, so it's a little too soon to you know, fall in love with it. Maybe there's something I haven't discovered yet about it that's not good. But so far, I really like it. I think it's going to be perfect for a shelter environment. Um, it's flexible. It's got some some give to it. Um, you know, this is flexible, and you know, so unlike that rigid knot, if 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 it becomes too tight, this is going to have some give that will um, allow it to open up and accommodate that. Uh, the tubing is more durable than that cord lock, so it's going to take teeth strikes much much better. Um, it's made using parts from from the local hardware store. You don't have to you know, go out of your way to source things like that cord lock. Um, you know, Ace Hardware sells this tubing by the foot. Uh, Lowe's and uh, Home Depot both have this. I forget if they sell it by the foot or not, but you can buy 10 foot coils or 100 feet. You can buy it on Amazon. That's where I found the lowest price so far. And I'll put that information in the description of this video where I've where I found the lowest price in bulk. Um, and that, you know, that adds up for me. That's another positive. It's, this is the least expensive stopper to make. So for me, that adds up over time. Um, you know, I, I haven't talked about this part yet, but this is another positive with this is when you melt uh, these, these ends, these uh, paracord ends, it's quite possible to get some snags, some sharp edges around here that'll snag the fibers of the rope. And so I talk about that later in the video where I show you how to melt this. And again, table of contents in the description of the video. You can jump there quickly. Um, this, the way this plastic acts as a collar around the base of this knot, you know, I found that if, if there are some snaggy areas, some sharp edges, it really doesn't matter because uh, this shunts the rope away. So it's, it's less of an issue. So I can make these faster. That's good. I like that. It doesn't take as much time really getting a super smooth surface. If, if those snags are down low here, uh, it really doesn't matter because you can't get to them um, 
like they would be a problem without this tube. So, so that's another positive. Um, you know, it's it's not particularly attractive, but in a shelter, who cares? Um, you know, and again, it's, it's I don't I can't think of a a better stopper. I mean, really, one one that's going to be as resilient to teeth strikes, and one that has uh, the capability to sort of auto tension. I I don't know if you can see this, but I cut this tube in half. You know, I put a slit halfway through it. And, that creates a, a natural springiness where it wants to go back to its straight position and uh, that kind of auto tensions the uh, the grip on the rope here if it's if it's a little too loose starting out this this tightens that up and then over time as as the rope uh, wears and it gets that fuzzy fatter surface and this needs more uh, uh, girth to it to allow it to pass over that um, you know, this is going to give into that. It'll, it'll, the, the legs will kick in. You know, this has some give in it. Um, you know, it, it, it can compress some like this. If this did become too tight, um, that can be corrected. You could, first thing to do would be to cut this uh, connection between the two pieces, uh, which creates that tension right there, and that would create two separate uh, independent tubes, and that would give it a little more play. Um, Another thing to do would be to lay it on its side and cut a little slit. I can't see here. There it is. Cut a little slit right through here, lay it on its other side, do the same thing. And what you want to do is create a little V notch right there. Do it on the other side. And uh, that would let that would let the uh, the tube kick out a little further and allow the knot to come down a little bit and that would give it some some slack down here and if you do that one thing to be aware of is you don't want to lower it so much that the that the ring can pass over it so um, be aware of that but anyway you know this compared to the rigid knot this does have a lot more uh, adjustment to it these stoppers use the same two knots a girth hitch knot and a snake knot this segment is going to show the details of how to tie those two knots. Uh, the next segment I'm going to make each one of these individually and show maybe how the knots might be a little different or how to do it. But um, you know the basics of how to tie these two knots will be in this segment. It's important to pre-shrink your paracord. Um, you know it's not as important with this one because you have so much adjustability. With this one it's critical because you have no adjustability. Um, Later in the video, I show how I pre-shrink a large quantity of paracord, and I also show how I cut a large quantity of paracord to save time. So again, the description of the video, you can jump to any topic. To make the girth hitch knot, um, I start with the slip leads loop on my left side, and I do that just for consistency so they turn out the same way. You don't, you don't have to do that. Um, one thing I want to point out though right here is that if, if you're making these and you thread the handle through this uh, ring, there's two ways to do that. And you, want to, you want to make sure you do it the way that gives you the smooth side on the inside of the loop. If you did it the other way and this corner was on the inside of the loop, that wouldn't feel good on the dog's neck. Okay, so and again, it's important to pre-shrink your paracord. Uh, this is 20 and a half inches of paracord, but uh, that doesn't matter, you're going to use different lengths for the different stoppers and we'll get into that later. Um, so what you, what you want to do is you know, fold it over like this and have this loop, put it under the rope, and then put the two ends through and just pull that tight. That right there is a girth hitch knot. So it's pretty simple. I like to uh, leave one end a little longer for me this end. This will help when tying the snake knot at the end. If you were left-handed you might want to have that side longer. Okay, so now I just go around again, make a loop, go through it. And I don't know if this knot has a, a name, I'm calling it a double girth hitch knot. It gives you four coils on the rope. So that's it right there. This works good. I've I've made slip uh, stoppers with just 
these four coils, just the double girth hitch knot, and it works okay, but I like to go one more time around and through, and uh, as you might have guessed, I'm calling this a triple girth hitch knot. It gives you six coils on the rope. So, just like that. I like this one better because it has more surface area to make contact with the rope, and I feel like that gives a more uniform, stable uh, grip on the rope. When I, when I just do the four, I don't know, sometimes it feels like it might be... It's hard to maintain that sweet spot. It seems like it might be too tight or too loose, and this one just seems like it's a good, solid fit. So I like this one better. To tie the uh, snake knot, what I do is I, uh, I just take this end. This is the end that I said to leave a little longer for me being right-handed. If you're left-handed, you might want this one to be longer. But the way I do it, I take this end, which is, should be a little bit longer, and uh, put it between my finger and thumb, and just I just rotate it clockwise, and that forms it right into that loop like that, where it goes underneath itself. So just rotate it and go underneath. And once you've got that loop, you take this strand and you go down through the top, come come up from behind. So we've got that right there, and you're going to come up from behind and go back down through the top again. And that gives you something that looks something like a figure eight, if you look at it right, or a pretzel. And um, let me do that again, just in case. It's kind of hard to see. My hands are in the way. So. Thumb and finger, just spin it clockwise, it goes under itself, it just forms that loop naturally. Take this one, go down through the top, up from behind, and then down through the top again. And that's it there. You can Google for videos showing how to make snake knots. There might be other ways to tie it. I found a video showing this, and that's all I've done. Um, so, you know, when, when you're making this, the next thing that would happen is you would cut, you want to tighten this up very tight, make this snake knot extremely tight because you're going to cut the ends off and melt the ends. However, you know, when you're making these stoppers, you don't really have to do that. You could use some, a little longer paracord, tie a second snake knot and just tighten it down on itself and leave it that way so you can untie it later, make a final adjustment after using the slip lead for a while. Uh, and then cut the ends and uh, melt it. So that would give you some flexibility that way to, you know, kind of have a second shot at it to get the tension right. And something else I want to mention, depending on how you cut your paracord, the way I cut mine, I can get some sharp edges on these ends. And this rope has really fine fibers. Each one of these little bundles has a lot of, it's almost like yarn. And so those those sharp edges can grab that. So when, when you're when you're putting this together, if you do have sharp edges, just be aware of that and be careful how you work with the rope and how you store them together and stuff, uh, because you can get some snags that'll hang on there and pull this out. And it's not a big deal. I created a video showing how to fix that. All you do is just burn it and melt it back in. Okay, this section of the video is going to go into details about each stopper. I've already shown how to tie the knots. And at the beginning of the video, I gave an overview of each stopper. I'm not going to repeat that information here. So uh, remember the description of the video. You can jump to any topic from there. This is the first stopper I made. And uh, it's pretty easy to make because it's just uh, paracord. You don't have to mess with too much. I use a second strand of paracord to make it uh, fatter, larger, stiffer. And uh, these are just two snake knots. You know, this is the triple girth hitch knot, and then these are two snake knots pushed down on top of it. Um, I've already shown how to tie the girth hitch knot, so I've got one set up here. And if you need to see how that's done, uh, go back to the previous section. And again, the description of the video has a list of topics. You can jump to a topic real easily from there. 
Um, so before we tie the snake knots, what, what you have to do is you, know, you get this kind of set up and then you have to loosen this. Might be better to do it while you're tying it. But you want to get these two, those two pulled up and then slip this this red one. It doesn't have to be red. I use this color just to make it easier to see. There it is. Oops. There it is. Okay. So just try to put that in the middle like that and then tighten this again. This, you know, this uh, this stopper takes some practice to get right because you have to kind of get the tension on the rope, the grip on the rope, just about where you want it. and So it takes a little bit of a experience to be able to do this quickly. So that's that. So now what we do is we tie the uh, snake knot. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how to tie this. I've already shown it in the previous section, so you can look at that. Um, but you get it set up. You get it into that figure eight. So there's that. And there's kind of a, a natural like higher hole and lower hole, right? This one's a little higher because this string comes out the lower half of it. This string comes out the upper half. So there's kind of a lower hole there. And uh, anyway, you just put one end through there. One end through this one. And now this is where it can be a little bit time consuming if you're making a lot of these. Uh, that's one thing I didn't like about this one too. Be sure to see the uh, overview for these stoppers at the beginning of the video because there's some information there that I don't repeat here. So now you know, you're going to kind of pinch and wiggle and walk the snake knot down and at the same time pull these two strands up. Tighten them. So you want it to look about like that. And again, what's tough about this is as you're doing that, it may get tight on the rope. So you may have to loosen um, the girth hitch knot on the rope and then work on it again some more. It's kind of a balancing act because you're, uh, you're pulling against like the center here against this part and also the outer edge where the outer part of the girth hitch was at where it ended. So you're, you're kind of working against two parts of it and pulling it together. So that to me looks pretty good just for what I'm doing here. And because that was sort of like the top oriented hole and this was the bottom oriented hole, I, I flipped these red ones out of the way in that direction and do another snake knot. Again, this one goes through that sort of top oriented hole. This one goes through that lower oriented hole. And you do the same thing. Pinch, wiggle, twist, work that down, pull these to do that. So there it is. That's pretty much it. You know, you just you want to get it kind of tight. And you want to make sure it has about the right tension. So that's the tough part is getting ending up with the right tension while you're doing all this because you can end up making it too tight. Um, so now what you would do is you, know, you would cut these off and melt the ends, and I'll show how to cut and melt later. But one thing you could do is, you know, you could just uh, tie these off, you know, tie a couple of knots on the end here and just leave it. So you could untie it later and make an adjustment after you've used it for a while to see if it's right. That would give you a little bit of a, <clears throat> a chance to uh, make a final adjustment before you cut it and melt it. You can tie that uh, stopper without the additional strand of paracord. That's what this is here. It's uh, I'm doing the double girth hitch knot with four coils. Here's two snake knots, but I don't have that extra strand that goes up through there. 
and so it's smaller. Um, this is this works fine on a three eighths inch rope and twenty millimeter ring. Um, you know it works great, but this doesn't work on the half inch rope and twenty five millimeter ring. It's too small and it'll pass through the ring too easily. Um, the only reason I'm mentioning this is that you know you can. You don't have to do what I'm doing. You can think outside the box, maybe come up with something that works better for you. Maybe you have a different circumstance. Maybe you buy a, a slip lead online and you need to replace the stopper and it's just a different configuration. You know, something like this might work. And you can also go larger. If you Google for paracord knots and weaves, uh, you know, you can find lots of designs out there. People are making things that are kind of big, maybe a ball that goes around the, uh, the rope. There's just lots of different things and you could find something where you could make a, a larger uh, stopper this way. Uh, the only thing to keep in mind there is that some of those things, they start to look like a chew toy. This is the cord lock stopper and uh, there's not much to show you. This is the triple girth hitch knot with the six coils. I show you how to make that earlier in the video. Um, all you have to do is just put the cord lock on. Um, the way I cut my paracord I have some kind of mushroomed ends and so they don't both fit at the same time so I have to put it through one at a time. There's one. There we go. And just kind of center it, get it where you want it. And, um, then just tie the snake knot on the end here. I've shown you how to do that earlier in the video too. And I try to tie the snake knot so it ends up leaving about uh, one and a half times the diameter of the rope. I just sort of aim for that. And if you want to buy these cord locks, I show in the description of the video where I buy mine, the lowest price that I've found, so that might be useful. Um, I want to say one thing. This cord lock, it works with my half inch rope and 25 millimeter ring. Um, if you if you were going to make your own slip lead and you went to the hardware store and bought rope and uh, maybe you'd buy a one inch ring, that ring would be just a little bit larger diameter and it might pass over this. I don't know. That's something to keep in mind. But there's like a whole lot of different cord locks out there. So if you look online, you might find something that would work for you if this doesn't. Um, I also make uh, slip leads in smaller and larger rope sizes. So I make quarter inch with 15 millimeter ring, 3 8 inch with a 20 millimeter ring, then the half inch with 25 millimeter, and then I make a 5 8 5 8 inch rope with a 30 millimeter ring. And so I'll put those details in the description of the video. These are the cord locks I use with those. This goes with the quarter inch um, rope. This one works with 3 8 inch and half inch, and this one I use with the with the 5 8 inch. It's pretty big. So I'll put in the description of the video where I get these two. This is the vinyl tube stopper and this is the tube. It's 1 quarter inch inside diameter, 3 8 outside. This is a common tube. You find it in the plumbing department at Home Depot, Lowe's, Ace Hardware sells it by the foot. If you look at the description below the video, I put the information there about where I buy mine, uh, the lowest price that I've found. I cut these one and a half inches long, and if you're just making one, you can just mark it with a sharpie and cut it with scissors. But if you donate slip leads to a shelter, if you make quite a few of these, I have an idea about how to cut these, a large quantity of them, quickly, uh, without much effort. And I'm going to put that at the end of the video, so if you want to see that, you can uh, look at the description below the video and jump directly to that topic. Um, so after I cut these one and a half inches long, I snip right in the middle about halfway through the through the tube and that's ready to to be used. This is the triple girth hitch knot and with the six coils. I show how to make this earlier in the video. You can look at that. Um, this is made with twenty and a half inches of paracord and it could be a little less. The ends end up being, there's a little too much excess at the end to cut off, so this could be less, but that's how this one is made. Something I do a little different with this one compared to the other stoppers, I make this a little tighter on the rope than I would the others. I'll, I'll tighten it up ahead of time more than it should be, <clears throat> and that'll, uh, you'll see why in a minute. 
This is easy to make. All you have to do is just fold the tube over and put the, uh, the ends through it. All right, there it is. So now I would just tie a snake knot here, but before I do, I want to show you something. Um, this tube has a tendency to want to go back to straight. So while you're tying the uh, snake knot, it could walk up on you. It could, it'll kind of work against you, and it you can, it could end up with some slack down here like this. And a little slack down here might not be bad, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But uh, you don't want a whole lot either. So keep an eye on that. Be aware of it. Be prepared for it. Um, okay, so I'm going to tie the snake knot, and I've shown I've showed you earlier in the video how to do that. So if you want to see how, just go back and look at that. All right, so there's a, a loose snake knot. Double check, make sure that these legs didn't creep up and kick out and that you don't have slack down here. And now what I do is I just put these between my finger and thumb and just pinch and kind of twist and walk it down. Just wiggle it and walk it down to the tube. And, you know, you can't really tighten this knot against the tube super tight because it, once it gets to that point it's the knot starts tightening against itself so there's a, a limit as to how far you can go with this and that's why I put the extra tension in the girth hitch knot if there's a, any slack in this when you loosen this up when you flex it and rotate it and <clears throat> cause cause this girth hitch to relax it's going to pull any slack in this structure into it and that'll that'll pull the knot tighter against the uh, the tube and it'll just create everything up here a little more tighter the way you might have wanted to get to from the top down and you can't really do that the way this works because it just the knot just tightens against itself so so anyway just make sure the knot is tight on itself once you get to the point that it it's against the tube and then you just you know, flex this and get it to relax, let it pull in some of the slack from this whole structure. So it's a balancing act, you know, it takes a little bit of practice to find the right starting tension and, uh, you know, how to, how far down you can get this knot onto the tube and then you just let everything kind of come together after that. I want to talk about this balancing act a little more. The, you know, when you tie the snake knot, the natural inclination is, is that this is going to be what you use to control how, how tight this is, the tension on it. And it doesn't work that way. All you can do is just sort of roll this knot down until it touches the tube. And at that point, you can't make it any tighter against the tube because it just, the knot tightens against itself. It just becomes a solid knot and it's not going to go anywhere. So that's why with the girth hitch knot, if you, if you make it a little bit tighter than you think you should, then when this is tightened, you can relax this girth hitch knot, and that'll pull the slack into it. So instead of, you'll, you'll get where you wanted to go, you just didn't do it from here, or you did it from here. And, and that takes some practice to know what that starting tension is to end up with the tension you want. Um, there's a couple other things you can do too, like um, this tube, you know, it, it it's almost like an auto-tensioning device. You know it. If there's any slack in this cord, the legs just kick out, and uh, it you know takes up that slack and maintains a reasonable tension uh, on the rope. So you could leave a little slack. There may be reasons to leave a little slack in this. Let the legs kick out a little bit, and uh, you know don't just make it straight like this. Let it come out and let that uh, let the paracord kind of curve around a little bit into there, and. Uh, you know, I don't think you'd really notice it. It doesn't seem to be a problem doing that because this just, the legs just go out a little bit further and, and they take that slack up for you and you don't notice it in this being looser. And maybe one reason to do that would be like, this is a new rope. Uh, the surface is smooth. <clears throat> There's not much friction. Um, after this rope is used for a while, the outer surface of fibers are gonna fray and break 
and it's going to have a cloth-like surface, kind of fuzzy, and it's going to have more friction. So at that point, this uh, girth hitch knot needs to enlarge a little bit, and so if there was some slack built into this, that slack would go into this and make it easier for that to happen. Um, you know, you can also control how springy this is. Um, if you cut that snip, when you snip right in the middle here, if you make that deeper, then this will be less springy. It won't have as much power to the spring. And if you make it a shallower snip, then it'll have more spring to it. It'll it'll want to go out with more force. So you have some control over that. You can adjust that too. But, you know, again, like... If this becomes too tight over time, um, I, I mentioned this in the at the beginning of the video, I gave like an overview of this thing and the pros and cons. And um, I mentioned there that if this becomes too tight, I'll just mention it again. You know, you, the first thing to do would be to snip this remaining piece of tube here that holds the two pieces together and just let it be two independent pieces of tube. That'll, that'll give some slack to it. And uh, another thing you can do is fold it over and cut a v-notch in on both of these you know so on, on this side you cut an angled cut and an angled cut here and then flip it over the other way and do the other angled cut and so you end up with a little v cut out and that would let these legs push out a little bit more let the knot go down a bit and that would create some uh, some slack but you don't want to let it go down so much that the ring could pass over it that's something to keep in mind but you know again you know, I, I've, I said earlier that I consider this part to be uh, disposable. I don't expect it to last uh, as long as the rope would. So, and it's cheap to make, it's just pennies. So, you know, you could always, if it were too tight, you could just cut it off and put a new one on. It's, it's not In the next segment, I'm going to show how to cut these ends off and melt the knot. But I just wanted to say real quick that if you... Uh, we're unsure about this tension, how it's going to work for you. You could tie this with a longer piece of paracord, tie a second snake knot on here, cut the ends off short, melt the ends, don't melt the knot, just the ends, and that way these wouldn't be a distraction to the dog. And that would let you use it for a while, and then you could untie the knot, make a final adjustment, and then just tie the single snake knot, cut the ends, and melt the knot like I'm going to show. Um, while I'm on this topic, I just want to mention real quickly, there's many different sizes of vinyl tube, inside, outside diameters, which translates into wall thickness. Um, Ace Hardware has quite a few of these. You can buy foot lengths of each one. And the reason you might want to do that, let's say you have a different slip lead, uh, the rope diameter is different, the ring size is different, maybe what I do doesn't work for you. Uh, you know, you could find something that would work, I'm sure. So, you know, don't just just be creative with it. You know, you can even find uh, some of these, like you can find an outside diameter that fits inside an inside diameter, and you can create a super thick uh, tube. Um, this is the first stopper I made with the vinyl tube, and this is 3 8 inch inside, half inch outside. Um, it's a little too floppy for my half-inch rope with the 25 millimeter ring, but I make a 3 8 inch rope with a 20 millimeter ring, and this might work for that. Might make it a little shorter. I don't know. This is 5 8 inch long. Um, you know, I also make a uh, 5 8 inch rope with 30 millimeter ring, and like this heavy tube here might work for that in that same kind of configuration where it's just a tube standing up. Otherwise, you know, I might use a heavier, you know, a heavier tube for the for the same design that I'm using here in this video, where it's kind of bent over and slid at the top. Um, this is a 3 16 inch inside diameter. That's pretty much the same diameter as the paracord. Paracord is about 3 16 of an inch diameter, so that would just barely fit through here. And, uh, you know, this might work for the quarter-inch rope that I use with the 15-millimeter ring. So, anyway, I'm just saying, you know, you can you can find things that, uh, you know, there's other options here, and if you're creative, you can find something that works. You know, one idea I had, I didn't go any further with it, but I was thinking about taking a tube such as this and uh, you know, cut, let's say, cut it like that long, cut it 
lengthways in half and then use one of those halves to create a C like this and put two holes in it, two holes, and run the paracord through and tie the knot on top and this would act as like a springy tensioner. I kind of had that idea for a while. I didn't do anything with it. but So I'm just saying, you know, you keep that in mind. This stuff's like Lego blocks. You can do a lot with it. In this segment, I show how to melt the snake knot using either a flame or a hot knife. If you're making more than one of these, I, I think the hot knife goes faster. Um, either way, whichever one you use, when you start, you just want to make sure the snake knot is tight. Um, that's the first step. And keep in mind that uh, when paracord burns or melts, I, I believe it's putting out gases, fumes that are uh, not very healthy. So you probably want to do this in a ventilated room in the garage under a, an exhaust fan, um, like in the bathroom. When I melt these with a flame, I like to cut the ends to a length that's about the same as the diameter of the paracord. So that's about 3 16 of an inch long. If you cut it longer, um, when you melt it with a flame, it, it liquefies, becomes molten, and if it's longer, uh, you can get too much of that and it'll drip and be a mess. Um, you can use any kind of flame, uh, a candle, a Bic lighter. I found this at Harbor Freight. It's not too expensive. It's refillable. You can find inexpensive refills online. I'll put that information where I found the lowest price for refills in the description below the video. Um, I made some mods to this though, and I'll, I'll show that at the end of the video, and again you can jump directly to that topic from the description in the video. Um, I like to, one thing I want to point out here, uh, this is, a, this is a, a regulator that allows, like it's like a carburetor, it lets air in, so if it's in this position where the hole is that allows air to come through, you'll have more of a powerful jet, and if you turn it as far away from that hole as you can, which is for me right about at that corner here, um, you get a, a gentler flame. So I like to run it here. Um, there's also a gas flow regulator on this side, and that's one of the mods I made to allow it to go down even lower for a gentler flame. Um, I also use a, uh, a file. I got this at Harbor Freight as well, and I use this to to shape the molten liquefied uh, material. And what I like about this is it, it leaves a texture that looks something like the texture of the surface of paracord. Um, when I melt these, I do them one at a time. And you can try to do both, but I think it's messier. And so what happens here is it ends up burning on its own. And I, unless I'm in a hurry, I'll just let it burn on its own. Like I said, you can you can help it along with the flame from the lighter, from the torch, but if I'm not in a hurry, I just let it do its thing. And when I use the uh, file, I lay it against the solid part of the, uh, of the knot and use that for stability, and then I just gently lean into it and kind of roll it. That liquefied stuff, if you press into it too fast, it'll smear out, it'll spread out, you'll get snaggy edges, sharp burrs and things. Um, this file acts as a heat shrink, so a heat sink, so as you, uh, you know, as you lean it into it, it'll start drawing the heat out and cool it down pretty quickly, so at that point you can start going a little farther, faster, firmer into it. Um, so that's that, that's how it looks, and let me do the other one. Oops, not enough. That's another mod I did to this lighter is if it has a little safety trigger that you have to engage each time you strike it and that gets old after a while. So I, I disabled that so I can just strike it easily. And again, I show that at the end of the video. And there's that smoke I was saying might not be healthy. Um, so now I just lean that, like I said, I place it against the unmelted part for stability and then I just start leaning it slowly into the liquid and as that steel sucks the heat out um, 
it'll it'll solidify faster and then you can I can lean into it press it more firmly roll it around so there it is so that's it now one thing to be aware of is you can create some snags on this sharp burrs that'll that'll catch on the rope and uh, you know if you had two or three of these together the leashes um, you know if you had them side by side this like packaged in a bag or something uh, those burrs would catch on the fibers and pull them out so but this one looks fine and if you did have that you can always just uh, you know hit it again and, and you ain't ooh, ouch you don't even have to uh, use the file you can just tap it with your finger and you know knock down the burrs this is a hot knife I bought it at Harbor Freight it's not too expensive it's not really made to be used this way mounted to a board this is a 1 by 12 board and I screwed it down onto the board for stability so I can use both hands and I don't have to hold this thing uh, another change I made is uh, it comes with a momentary button and it stays on as long as you hold that button and when you let off it turns off that doesn't work well in this uh, case either so I used electrical tape and just taped that button down so it comes on when I plug it in and it stays on until I unplug it um, it has a temperature dial right here and it goes from one to five I set mine between four and four and a half if I go higher than that the heat from this it can be too hot it can it can melt the uh, paracord too fast too too runny and the radiant heat from this can you know melt other things around the paracord as well so four four and a half works well for me when I cut these I cut them a little longer than when I use a flame uh, this is about a quarter inch to five sixteenths of an inch um, it takes about a minute to warm up to reach full temperature and I melt these one at a time just like the flame you could do two at a time it smokes more than the flame too so again this might be something to do outside in a garage I don't think this flame these uh, fumes are very healthy it doesn't liquefy as much as the flame so you can kinda lean into it heavier faster um, with this file and so there that is and now we'll do the other side I think this goes faster if you're doing quite a few of these you know if you're making a dozen of them this goes faster than the uh, the flame all right that's it there's a little bit of a a little bit of a burr here on each side but this plastic tube sort of shunts that away so I'm not going to worry about it um, Again, you know, be careful about burrs though, because they can snag on the rope, just like I said in the, when I showed how to do it with the flame. This is how I pre-shrink my paracord. Um, I bought this bucket at Lowe's. Uh, I like it because it's wider than most buckets this size. It's not as tall, so I thought that made it a little easier to work with, and you know, maybe allowed some better airflow for this to dry. But I un unspool like a hundred feet or a thousand feet of paracord into this. And uh, I use this PVC pipe. I mounted this in the center, and that helps keep it wound correctly so it doesn't tangle up when I'm pulling it out. Um, I drilled holes all around the side. Uh, there's holes on the bottom, and uh, you see here, this one thing I don't like about the bucket is that it's the plastic's kind of brittle, and so it cracked a lot, or cracked a few times while I was drilling, and that it doesn't bother me I don't care but uh, I drilled one hole in the center here for the pipe and I use these PVC fittings this is a bushing it goes from female thread to a slip joint here for the pipe to slip into and then I use this threaded plug uh, so it this goes inside the bucket this goes on the bottom on the outside and then I have a three-quarter inch washer. I forget if it's just an ordinary washer or a fender washer, but I have one on the inside and one on the outside. And I also forget if I had to do this, but these these things aren't meant to thread in and tighten all the way down. So 
if 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 the pipe wasn't uh, solid, you know, if you couldn't tighten it that much to get a good solid fit on the bottom of the bucket, you might have to use a hacksaw and cut through this, maybe both ways, to allow it to flex open so this can thread in deeper into it so you get a good tight fit on the bottom. But anyway, that's that. There's the washer there. There's one on the inside as well. And that just helps it not stress the plastic as much so it won't crack. Um, anyway, so I have a second one of these without the holes. And I slip this inside that one. I fill it with water just out in the backyard with the hose. Let it soak for a while. I might, you know, kind of help it. And, uh, and then I just pull this out and let it drain. And then I just leave it in the backyard to dry for a couple of days. And again, I might fluff it up to try and help it dry. So, you know, it's pretty simple. And, you know, you can do a lot of, lot of uh, paracord at once. Um, the only possible downside is that hot water and drying with heat might cause it to shrink a little more. So, depending on which stopper you're using, that might be an issue. But anyway, once it's dry, then I can start cutting it. And I've got another video coming up next showing how I... Uh, cut this stuff quickly, a lot of it at once, quickly. I made this frame, and right now it's just C-clamped together because I've been experimenting with different uh, stoppers, so I haven't really nailed it down into a permanent frame, uh, but eventually I intend to use these corner braces and cut these pieces off uh, flush and you know, make a real frame out of it. But the idea is, um, there's the start of it right there. So you put that kind of in the middle somewhere and then wind the paracord around this frame. I would go all the way down, uh, but I just stopped here for demonstration purposes. And then maybe put, I've just been using like a metal, metal ruler, put that in the middle and that just serves as a guide to uh, stay in the middle. Uh, eventually though, whenever this is a full frame, I intend to use a sheet of metal like this. You can get this metal at uh, Home Depot or Lowe's. They have it in the uh, uh, roofing department. This is called flashing. and uh, They sell it there. It's like two dollars. It's really cheap. Anyway, this would just protect the background, whatever you're doing, because the way you cut it, again, that hot knife, earlier in the video I showed the hot knife, this is another one. The other one's mounted to a piece of wood. I use this one to cut the paracord. And you just draw it, you just draw it right along and it cuts it. And that's what this metal would be for, is to protect the uh, whatever's underneath, or the underside, actually, the other side of the paracord. Um, you wouldn't want to cut that side, you just want to cut this side. And so that cuts them pretty quickly. Uh, the only downside is, is that it makes a uh, kind of a jagged edge on the uh, ends and that can snag on the rope, but you just have to be careful. Um, you know, the alternative is to cut them individually, melt them individually, and that's very time consuming. So anyway, that's how I cut the paracord. Th this piece of wood is nine and a half inches across from the outside to the outside. Nine and a half inches. It's three quarter inch wide wood. They saw this at Home Depot. And, uh, and that makes, when you wind it around and then cut one side, that makes the paracord to be about 21 inches long, 20 and a half, 21. So because I make a lot of these, I thought it would be tedious to have to mark and cut each one individually. So. I found this tool at Home Depot. It's called an Apollo PEX cutter. It's for cutting PEX tubing. I'll put the model number in the description below the video. Um, there's different brands, all the same kind of cutter. They're not very expensive. However, you will find some of these pipe cutters that have a ratcheting handle. You have to pump it a few times before it cuts, and that's for cutting thick PVC tube. You don't want to use that. That would be a hassle having to operate the handle multiple times to get a cut. Um, the first thing I did with this is I wrapped the tip of the blade with three layers of duct tape. And that's because that slot that it goes into is kind of wide and it had some movement in there. So I thought this would help keep it centered and give a more consistent cut. 
and it cuts the tube fine but you know my goal is I want to automate this where I don't have to mark the tube I just want to be able to cut it and just have it cut the right length all the time so this, I made this out of the same wood that I made the paracord cutting frame it's three quarter inch square you can find this at Home Depot it's not painted though this is from something I did a long time ago and I just found it in the garage and I made it out of this um, I cut this this piece long enough so that when it's up against the the edge of this uh, cutter that's one and a half inches from the blade to the washer and the washer is just screwed onto the end here and so when you're making this if, if it's too long you can just sand the end off until you get the right length if you go too far and it's too short you can put a little washer underneath this one to space it out a little um, you want this to be you don't want this to rise above the edge of this because then the tube would catch on it when you're pushing it through. You want it to be just a little bit lower and you can sand the bottom of this uh, and, and lower this block of wood until you get it to where you want it to be. Um, same thing over here. I drilled, I drilled a hole. It's one size larger than 3 8 inch which is the diameter of the tube and uh, Again, you want that to be just a little higher than this uh, this ledge. If it were down below it, then it would snag as you're pushing it through. It would kind of catch here. Um, and you can adjust that by just sanding the bottom of this. Um, what I may do on this, though, is I may use a countersink bit that would sort of bevel this edge so it's a little easier to get the tube in there. You know, it would kind of funnel into that hole. So ultimately all this stuff is just glued together you know I just put wood glue on the pieces and put a clamp on it and clamped it together and let it dry that should be strong enough but what I'm gonna do eventually when I'm ready is I'm gonna epoxy this tool into this wood and probably not epoxy it'll be a JB weld I think that's stronger than epoxy but anyway I'm gonna just put it into a bed of, uh, of epoxy you know on the sides and on the bottom and then it'll just be one tool all together and hopefully what I could do then is you know just holding the tool with this attached to it I could just push the the tube through until it hits that washer snip it you know do another one snip it just over and over again I should be able to not even have to look at it I could just watch TV and you know fill a bucket full of these things something else I plan to do is cut two more of these blocks the same length and glue them on the side right here but a little bit higher um, just to create a channel so that, that tube stays in this area here it it tends to kind of curve off one way or the other I said I modded my Harbor Freight micro torch and the easiest way to show that to you is this is one straight out of the box and the first thing I didn't like is that you can't ignite it without pulling this trigger down and then when you do ignite it the trigger goes back up or this little safety goes back up you can't do it again so you, you know if you use it the way I do you're doing this a lot and that's not fun so the first thing I did was I cut a, a little piece of a, a matchstick a wooden matchstick I cut the a little piece off the end and I uh, stuck it down inside there and that just keeps this pushed down so it doesn't keep going back up I think I put some wood glue or epoxy on one side of that match stick and uh, not the part I, not the part that touches this the part that touches uh, this part this is stationary so that helps keep it in there and one thing I want to say is you know if you do this remember you know there could be a safety hazard if you have kids in the house and you don't want them doing this or if you traveled with it and there were a risk of it accidentally uh, you know pressing and, and igniting like in your luggage or something that would be a problem so um, the other thing I didn't like is you know in the video I told you about this carburetor this air hole right here you know when you allow maximum air to come in the flame is like a, a real hot jet torch and uh, for me I turn this about to here and that creates the gentlest flame I just noticed with this one the hole is here so evidently they're all different and so this one would probably go about here for the gentlest flame but 
what I wanted to point out is you can also reduce the flame by reducing the gas flow and there's a little there's a a little protrusion right here that hits the edge of this cover and it won't go any further and so if you remove the sticker it reveals a screw and you can take the cap off there's nothing in here you want to mess with but um, you can cut away part of this uh, edge and that'll let that thing turn further and so one thing also I want to mention it's real easy to put this on backwards and it'll kind of almost go on and you'll spend a lot of time trying to figure out why it won't go on and I just did that a few minutes ago okay so you know with this thing here what I like about this is when when you refill this when you use the butane and fill this up again the pressure the added pressure causes the flame to be stronger and that's one reason I wanted to be able to go lower with this because when it's full um, it's, sometimes that flames a little more than I want it to be so um, as the as the pressure decreases as the fuel is used up more um, the uh, the flame will go down and then that's when you may want to turn this up and sometimes it'll be so far down that you can't reach this thing and you'll have to use a little tool like this to pull it up um, so anyway so far this has worked really well for me but uh, one thing I also want to mention if you do have the fuel really low and you have a problem with it not igniting that may be that the fuel doesn't have enough time to build up in here before the igniter strikes so if you listen to this you can press it halfway and you can hear the the gas flow and so that would be the solution if you ever have a problem where especially when the flow is low if you ever have a problem where uh, you know it won't ignite it's probably because you're doing it too fast just go like halfway let that fuel fill in here a little bit and then click to ignite and it should work